Welcome back to Digital Systems 1 and today we're going to be discussing flip-flops and how they can be used to create a counter. So um, we're going to be using JK flip-flops and we're going to go over the design you would use to take those flip-flops and form a circuit that will count up in binary. So in, just in case it's been a minute since you've reviewed flip-flops, let's just quickly review how the JK flip-flop operates. Remember that it has two inputs, J and K, as well as a clock input. Your clock input will control when the output of the flip-flop, which is labeled as Q, will change. And the output will change based off of whatever is being supplied to the inputs J and K at the exact moment that the clock makes a transition. So here's the truth table for a JK flip-flop we can see that if J and K are both low when the clock makes a positive transition, then the output is no change. If J is high while K is low when the clock makes a positive transition, that's what the up arrow tells us, uh, then the output will be one. If J is low while K is high when the clock makes a positive transition, the output will be zero. And if J and K are both high, then the output is going to toggle when the clock makes a transition. So this is just a quick reminder of how the JK flip-flop operates. And here's a quick example. It's the same example that we did in a previous video, just showing that <clears throat> as J and K change, uh, the only time the output will change is when the clock makes the applicable transition. In this case, I know that the clock has to make a positive transition because there's no bubble on the diagram given to me. If there were a bubble, then I'd know that the flip-flop would react to negative transitions instead of positive ones. So for each positive transition, we're simply going to look up and see what J and K are at that moment in time and determine what the flip-flop is going to do for the output. So we can see right here, if J is low and K is high, the output of the flip-flop will reset, it'll clear. When J and K are both high, here J is high and K is high when they're both high, the output of the flip-flop will toggle. So that just means it'll go from low to high or from high to low. Uh, here's an example where the flip-flop will have no change because both J and K are low, no change. So that's just a quick review of JK flip-flops. We need to really understand how a JK flip-flop works because today we'll, we will be discussing how to use a JK flip-flop to create a counter circuit. Also a reminder that your flip-flop can be clocked by a positive edge or a negative edge of the clock. You'll wanna look for a bubble in front of the clock input. In the truth table, if the arrows are going up, that tells you it responds to a positive transition. And if the arrows are pointing down, that tells you it responds to a negative transition. You do have to pay attention to what type of flip-flop you have and what transitions it will respond to because it makes a big difference in the output you're going to see with Q. So the first type of counter we're going to talk about is called an asynchronous or a ripple counter. And the diagram on the screen is an example of what an asynchronous ripple counter would look like. In this particular example, we have four flip-flops. And instead of the outputs being labeled as Q, we're going to label them as A, B, C, and D so we can tell the difference between each flip-flop. So the output is labeled just alphabetically starting with letter. Each flip-flop is a JK flip-flop. We can also see that each clock input is going to respond to a negative transition because of the bubbles shown on each of these diagrams. Another thing that you'll want to notice at the bottom, it says all J and K inputs are assumed to be one. So J and K don't have an input here on the picture. Uh, just to make the picture a little clearer and cleaner to see, we're going to make an assumption. All the J and K inputs are automatically assumed to be one. So remember with the truth table of a flip-flop, we know that if J and K are one, the output of the flip-flop is going to toggle. So with this particular circuit, since J and K are always going to be one, they're always going to be tied high, we know that for each of these flip-flops, 
Every time the clock makes a negative transition, the output of each flip-flop is going to toggle. <clears throat> now, another thing I want you to notice is that this symbol right here represents an external clock signal, like the clock signal you might use from a function generator. That goes into flip-flop A. But notice that the output of flip-flop A becomes the input of flip-flop B. The output of flip-flop A is the clock signal for flip-flop B. The output of flip-flop B is the clock signal for flip-flop C, and so on. So we can see that there's only one external clock signal, and then the output of each flip-flop becomes the clock signal of the next. This is a defining characteristic of an asynchronous ripple counter. Now, if we were to wire this counter, the outputs of the counter would be output D, C, B, and A. And imagine that each one of these outputs is also being connected to an LED, as well as being connected to a clock signal for the next flip-flop. So when we think about the output of this counter, the output is going to be the output of D, C, B, and A, each one of those individual outputs. And those outputs are going to form a 4-bit binary number, with the flip-flop D being the most significant bit. So if I have four flip-flops in my counter, I'm going to be creating a counter that can count up to, uh, we, that can give an output with four bits. And your last flip-flop in line is going to represent your most significant bit of that number. So now we're going to take a look at how does this circuit actually create a counter? How does it actually count? And by we're going to draw a waveform to do that. So if you look up at the top, the same circuit I just showed you is here. Remember that all the J and K inputs are one. So we're going to start by just writing the output of flip-flop A as a waveform. So keep in mind that if J and K are always one, the output of flip-flop A is just going to toggle every time the clock makes a negative transition. So we're going to assume that the output of flip-flop A is initially zero. That means that every time the clock makes a negative transition, this flip-flop is just going to toggle. So we can see there's a negative transition here, 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 and so forth. So we know that if A originally starts out low, going to toggle right here and go high. And then the next clock signal, it'll toggle and go low. The next clock signal, it will toggle and go high. And so forth. So the output of flip-flop A will look something like this. So as long as this counter is connected to power, flip-flop A is just going to continue toggling like this forever. Just at each negative transition, the output of flip-flop A will toggle. So now let's talk about flip-flop B. Flip-flop B has a clock signal that's coming out of flip-flop A. So now, whenever flip-flop A makes a negative transition, flip-flop B will toggle. So take a minute and try to identify, well, where are the negative transitions for flip-flop A? That would be any time flip-flop A goes from high to low, like right here, right here, right here, right here, and so on. So any time that flip-flop A makes a negative transition, flip-flop B is now going to toggle. So that means that the waveform for flip-flop B would look something like this. Originally, flip-flop B is zero, and flip-flop B won't toggle until A makes a negative transition. So your output waveform for flip-flop B will look something like this. I'll go ahead and erase this just to make it a little clearer to see. 
feel free to rewind if you need to see those uh, markings again. <clears throat> so now we know the output for flip-flop B. And then the same thing applies for flip-flop C. Flip-flop B is now the clock signal for flip-flop C. So anytime flip-flop B makes a negative transition, like right here, and right here, and right here, flip-flop C will then toggle. So flip-flop C will start out low, and it will stay low until flip-flop B makes that transition, since flip-flop B is the clock input. So flip-flop C is going to look something like this. And then we have the same concept for flip-flop D. So we know that flip-flop D is only going to toggle whenever flip-flop, the output from flip-flop C makes a negative transition. We only have one of those and it happens right here. So here's the output of flip-flop D. I'm sorry, there was one more right here. So now we can see the output of each flip-flop as this clock signal begin, begins to send a signal to the first flip-flop. So we have a ripple effect where the output of flip-flop A becomes the clock signal of flip-flop B, the output of flip-flop B becomes the clock signal for flip-flop C, etc. And this is what we would see in terms of waveforms when uh, we build a circuit like this. Now, the next question is, how does this prove that this circuit is a counter? How is it counting? How would we know that? What we're going to do is look at the output of each flip-flop D, C, B, and A. We're going to look at those outputs. We're going to use those outputs to create a number. Output D is the most significant bit of our number, so we're going to read bottom to top. So look at the output right now for this moment in time. Output D is 0, 0, 0, 0. These are all 0. Next, we have 0, 0, 0, 1. Next, we have 0, 0, 1, 0. Next, we have 0, 0, 1, 1. If you notice a pattern here, that's counting up in binary. So if you were to go through and look at the waveform for each moment in time before the next clock transition occurs, you'll see that it starts at 0, 0, 0, 0. It goes up to 0, 0, 0, 1. 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. And this is simply counting in binary. 0, 1, this would be 2, this is 3, this is 4, this is 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 111 would be 15. Notice what happens after we get to 1111, everything recycles back to zero. So with this counter, you start at zero, you go up to 15, and you start over again. Because if you think about it, the number 16 requires five bits. Five bits means you need five flip-flops, and we only have four. So you're limited by how many flip-flops you have. The more flip-flops you have, the higher number you can count up to. So take a minute and convince yourself that this is in fact counting if we consider the outputs of flip-flop D, C, B, and A to be digits of a binary number. Remember that the output of flip-flop D is the most significant bit of that binary number. So if we were to build a circuit like this on the breadboard, we would have the outputs of flip-flop D, C, B, and A going to LEDs, and we would see the LEDs light up in this sequence, showing that it's just counting in binary from 0 to 15. And then it would recycle back to 0, so we call this like the reset point, where the count 
starts over. That's your reset point right there. And then it'll just continue to count back up from zero up through 15 again. This is the basic waveforms for an asynchronous ripple counter using four flip flops. So when we have counters, we have a very important definition of how the counter works, and that's called the mod number. The mod number is equal to the number of states the counter goes through before recycling or starting over. And this uh, idea that the mod number is the number of states is really, really, really important. So you're going to want to underline that, write that down, highlight that. It's the number of states. Now, what do we define as a state? A state is like a unique output. So for example, each one of these counts is a state. And as the counter changes, each state is different. Until you get up to 1111, and then it will recycle back to the first state. Each one of these is a state. So the counter begins here. It counts up to 15. Then it recycles back to zero. How many states does this counter have? If you said 15, you would be incorrect. The counter counts up to 15, but how many individual states does it have? It has 16 states because zero counts as a state. So we have zero, one, two, three, four, five. Each one of these states counts as a state. So when you're considering the mod number, you'll count each one of these states as part of that mod number. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 states in this particular counter, 16 states. So we would say that this counter is a mod 16 counter because it has 16 individual states. So the mod number has nothing to do with what it counts up to. The mod number simply means how many states, unique states, will I have before the counter starts counting over again. Keep in mind, too, that the mod number will always be equal to 2 to the n, where n is the number of flip-flops in the circuit. So if you look at the example that we just did on the previous slide, we had four flip-flops. 2 to the 4 is 16. So before even building this counter or doing a waveform, I know automatically this counter has a maximum of 16 states, which means it's going to start counting at zero, go up through 15, and start over. So if you add flip-flops to your circuit, you will increase the mod number. You'll increase the number of states that you could have, which means you increase your range for how high you can count up to. So a very important definition that you'll want to really study and understand is the idea of mod number. A mod number is the number of states. It's not the number of flip-flops. It's not how high the counter counts up to. It's the number of states you'll see in the output. One thing that you can see when you look at the waveforms that we drew with the first example is that counters also act as a frequency divider or a period doubler. So here's an example of that. Think about the period, which is the amount of time it takes for one complete cycle in flip-flop A. This only took two time periods, from time zero to time two. Now look at flip-flop B. How long did it take one cycle of that square wave to complete? It took four periods. It took twice as long. If you look at flip-flop C, the period for flip-flop C it's going to take eight time periods to complete, twice as long as the one before. So we call that period doubling. The period gets longer and longer and longer. And since period and frequency have an inverse relationship, if the period doubles, the frequency is then divided by two. So we call the uh, any counter can also be called a frequency divider. And in any counter, your output frequency from your very last flip-flop will always be equal to the input frequency supplied from your function generator divided by the mod number for that counter. So 
For example, a mod 16 counter, uh, the output from the last flip flop, that would be flip flop D in our example, will have a frequency that's 1 16th of the input clock frequency. Because if you have a mod 16 counter, you're taking your input frequency and dividing it by that mod number to figure out your output frequency from your last flip flop. So if you have a mod number of 16, you're dividing your input frequency by 16. If you had a mod 8 counter, you would have an output frequency that's 1 8th the input frequency. We call that a divide by 8 counter. So um, when, you, when you change the mod number, you also affect the frequency of your output. Your frequency is constantly being exponentially divided the more flip-flops that you add. So now let's do an example. A counter is needed that will count the number of items passing on a conveyor belt. The counter must be able to count as many as 1,000 items. How many flip-flops are required? Take a second to pause the video and try to answer this question on your own. If you weren't sure how to attack this problem, one method would have been guess and check. So let's just say as an example, I take a guess. Let's say that I'm gonna make a counter with eight flip-flops. If I'm gonna make a counter with eight flip-flops, what could that count up to? That would be dependent on the number of states. Number of states meaning the mod number. If you have eight flip-flops, that will provide two to the eight states or 258, 256 states. That would be considered a mod 256 counter. A mod 256 counter can only count from 0 to 255. That's not enough flip-flops. So 9 flip-flops would have 2 to, the nine, 2 to the 9th states or 512 states. A counter with 512 states can start counting at 0 and go all the way up to 511. Remember, 0 counts as a state, so we're not counting up to 512. We're counting up to from 0 to 511. Still not enough if I need a counter to count as many as 1,000 items. 10 flip-flops would provide 2 to the 10 states or 1,024 states. That means that if I had 10 flip-flops, my counter could count from 0 to 1,023. So I need at least 10 flip-flops if I want a counter to count up to at least 1,000. And then if I needed to count higher than 1,023, I'd have to continue increasing the number of flip-flops to that counter. Now take a look at the second question. What is the frequency at the output of the last flip-flop if the input clock's frequency is 1 megahertz? For this question, we're simply going to use the formula that was provided earlier, where the output frequency is equal to the input frequency divided by the mod number. Now, I want you to think really carefully about what is the mod number of this circuit. Let's assume that we're going to go with 10 flip-flops to build the circuit. What's the mod number if I'm going to use 10 flip-flops? If you said that the mod number is 10, that would be incorrect. Remember, the mod number is the number of states. Number of states in your counter's output. So when we, can, when we compute this output frequency, we're going to be doing one megahertz divided by two to the 10th, which is 1,024. That'll give you a frequency out of 976.6 hertz. So again, this is a great example where you have to understand what mod number really means. It's not 10, it's two to the 10th because 10 is the, just the number of flip-flops you would need. Two to the 10th is the number of states you would have, and that's the definition of mod number. Let's try another problem where we're going to design a frequency divider that takes an input of four kilohertz and produces an output of 250 hertz. Take a second to try this on your own before you review the solution that's coming next. So if you're going to design a frequency divider, keep in mind, that's another name for a counter, a ripple counter, that um, it takes an input of 4 kilohertz and produces an output of 250 hertz. 
One way you might do this is to use the equation frequency out equals frequency in divided by mod number. Since we know the output frequency and we know the input frequency, we can manipulate this equation and rewrite it to solve for the mod number. Mod number has to be equal to frequency in divided by frequency out. So the mod number is equal to 4 kilohertz divided by 250 hertz, which is 16. So now that we have the mod number, what does that tell us? How many flip-flops do I need? If you said 16, that would be incorrect. Remember, the mod number is number of states, not number of flip-flops. And mod number is equal to 2 to the n. So we know that 2 to the n equals 16. We solve that for n to get the number of flip-flops. So we need a circuit that has four flip-flops. In order to produce this frequency divider that takes an input of 4 kilohertz and produces an output of 250 hertz. That would actually look exactly like the first example I showed you with the four flip-flops shown. If we happen to have needed five flip-flops, you'd simply draw a fifth flip-flop connected to the, uh, the last flip-flop here. You connect that to flip-flop D. If you only needed three flip-flops, you would just eliminate flip-flop D. So you can repeat the same concept that is shown here by adding or deleting flip-flops as needed. In this case, we need four flip-flops to create this frequency divider. So ripple counters are very useful for creating a simple circuit that can count, but there is one major drawback. Each flip-flop is triggered by the output of the flip-flop before it. So each flip-flop is going to experience a delay. If we had 10 flip-flops, that delay might be very small and insignificant. But what if we had thousands of flip-flops that were connected together in the ripple form? The delay that we would have will become very large. Imagine flip-flop number 2,000 or 3,000 waiting for every flip-flop before it to get its output before that flip-flop can toggle. So the delay can become very large. Asynchronous counters are not very useful for high frequencies or counters that have um, a large range that they're counting up to. So these are great for smaller numbers, like so you only wanna count from zero to 10, or if you're doing lower frequencies. But anytime you really increase the frequency of your clock signal, or you're really trying to count to a very large value, the, the delay and these counters can really add up. And what will happen is that you'll have an erroneous count and you'll have glitches. An erroneous count just means all of a sudden it won't be counting in sequence anymore. It will count, the count will look out of order, which doesn't work when we need something to count in sequence. So here's a quick example. If you have a delay, of 50 nanoseconds for a flip-flop to change from 0 to 1 or from 1 to 0, then flip-flop A is going to take 50 nanoseconds to toggle when the clock makes its transition. Flip-flop B is then waiting 100 nanoseconds before it can toggle. It has to wait 50 nanoseconds for flip-flop A to change here and then another 50 for flip-flop A to change here before it can make its toggle. Now, if you only have a few number of flip-flops, this might not be a big deal. But the longer that you, um, you, the longer that you make the delay and the more flip-flops that you add, you can start to see that your count becomes out of sequence. So for example, if you look at these waveforms here, as the delay increases and increases and increases, um, you can get to a point where your count, if you look at the outputs and look at the, uh, the outputs the same way that we read the count in our previous example, it's not going to count in order. In this example here, by the time you get to 100, you won't actually see the number 100 in your count. One, number 100 will look like it's disappeared because of the delay in the system. So what is something we can do to solve the delay? One example is a synchronous counter, it's also called a parallel counter. In a synchronous counter, all the flip-flops are triggered simultaneously with the same clock signal, so we no longer have a ripple effect. We have all four flip-flops in this example connected to the same function generator 
clock signal. Because of that, we have a different orientation. So take a minute to look at this drawing. It looks very different from the ripple counter that we showed before. Notice that flip-flop A has both J and K tied to one. Flip-flop B has J and K tied to flip-flop A. Notice that flip-flop C has J and K tied to the output of an AND gate where A and B are fed into the AND gate. Flip-flop D has its J and K tied to the AND gate where A, B, and C go into an AND gate. So we can see here that there's a different orientation for this type of counter, but it does still count in binary the same way as the first example that we showed. And we're going to go through how that works by drawing a waveform. So up at the top here is a small picture of the counter that we're looking at, and we're going to draw a waveform for this counter just like we did for the other one. It's going to look the same, but it's going to, it's going to um, be generated with a slightly different idea. Let's start with flip-flop A. Flip-flop A has its J and K inputs tied to one. So we know that flip-flop A is going to just toggle every time that clock makes a transition, just like before. Now let's look at flip-flop B. Flip-flop B is going to have its J and K inputs tied to A. That means that whenever A is one, J and K are both one, and the flip-flop will toggle. But whenever A is zero, J and K are both zero, and the flip-flop will have no change. So whenever A is one, when the clock makes its transition, is when flip-flop B is gonna to toggle. And I'll say that one more time. Whenever the output of flip-flop A is high, just before a clock transition, flip-flop B will toggle. So at time point number two, just before this transition, flip-flop A is high. That means that J and K right here are both high and the flip-flop is going to toggle. If you look at time point number three, just before that transition, flip-flop A is low. Just before this occurs, flip-flop A is low. So that means that J and K are both low and there's no change. So we're only gonna see a toggle during the times where the clock makes a negative transition just as flip-flop A is high. So we're going to see the output waveform look like this. Right here at time point two, flip-flop A was high, flip-flop B will toggle. At time point three, flip-flop A was low, flip-flop B has no change. And then it'll toggle right here when A was high again. So we do end up with the same waveforms as before, but they're generated using a different theory or a different implementation. If you look at flip-flop C, flip-flop C is going to have its J and K inputs tied to A and B. So flip-flop C can't toggle until flip-flop A and B are both high just before a clock transition. So if you look at flip-flop B, flip-flop B is low here, flip-flop B is high here, look at this point right here. This is the point right here where flip-flop C is gonna toggle because A and B are both high just as this transition occurs. That's the time when flip-flop C will toggle. And it won't toggle again until this condition occurs again. So the next time that A and B are both high is right here. So at the time point eight, that's when we'll see the next toggle. And that's what you're gonna see in the waveform. So flip-flop C will only toggle when A and B are both high just before our next transition.
And then with flip-flop D, we know that flip-flop D can't toggle until A, B, and C are all high. The output of this AND gate will only be high when A, B, and C are all high. So when A, B, and C are all high, that's when flip-flop D will toggle. So we have two points where flip-flop D will toggle. So, like we said before, we knew that the waveforms were going to be the same because this is a counter. It has to count in the same manner. So we get the same waveforms as before, but how they're generated is, is, is very different. Using these AND gates in here, we can uh, allow the clock signal for all four flip-flops to come from the same place at the same time, thereby mitigating a lot of the delay that you would see in a ripple counter. If you look at the output for the counts, it's going to be the same. Starts at 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, all the way up to 1, 1, 1, 1 before it resets. So this is a mod 16 counter just like before with a, uh, a counting range from 0 to 15. So one of the some of the advantages of uh, synchronous counters is that the propagation delays do not add together to produce the overall delay. Instead, the total response time of a synchronous counter is the time it takes one flip-flop to toggle plus the time for the new logic levels to propagate through a single AND gate. So your total delay is really the delay of one flip-flop plus one AND gate even if you had 100 flip-flops in this design. Because, um, because of the fact that all the flip-flops change their outputs at the exact same time. So you have the same delay for all four flip-flops occurring at the same moment in time. And the same thing with the AND gates. All the AND gates are changing their outputs at the same time. So you could have one AND gate or 100 AND gates, and the delay is going to be the same because they're all changing their outputs at the exact same time. So that's an advantage of a synchronous or a parallel counter. So the nice thing about this is that you can use a synchronous counter for higher frequencies, and you can use a synchronous counter when you want to count to larger numbers and you won't have to worry about that delay.